Thanks for joining us. For more great content like this, visit polishingthepulpit.com or search for Polishing the Pulpit in your favorite podcast app. Also, be sure to check out PTP365 for thousands of more videos just like this. You can learn more by visiting 365.polishingthepulpit.com and to make it easy for you, we've put a link in this video's description. Hi, and welcome to the PTP Teen Girls Group, hosted by the 70 West Church of Christ. We are focusing on women of the Bible. This week's lesson will be by Denise Martin on Ruth. Grab your Bibles and join us in tonight's lesson. Hi, girls. Welcome to the study tonight and any mamas and grandmamas that might have joined in. My name is Denise Martin, and I appreciate Brandy inviting me to speak to you. This lesson tonight is a happily ever after story. Girls love happily ever after stories, don't they? I know growing up, I loved uh, Snow White, Cinderella. Uh, it's just a fairy tale. It's usually about a girl who runs into multiple obstacles, but in the end, her Prince Charming, her handsome Prince Charming, rescues her, they get married and live happily ever after. But tonight, we're going to be talking about a real person who encountered a lot of obstacles, but she ends up living happily ever after. And we want to see what lessons that we can learn from the book of Ruth. Ruth is one of only two books in the Bible out of 66 that are named for a woman, the other being Esther. And I know you've already studied the book of Esther in this series of lessons. But Ruth, um, it, there's a lot of contrast between Ruth and Esther. Esther was a Jew who went to a far country and she ended up marrying a Gentile. Ruth is a Gentile who came from a far country to Israel and ended up marrying a Jew. The setting of the book of Ruth is during the Judges, although it doesn't specify which one or even who wrote the book. But it was a dark time in the history of God's people. Judges 17.6 and again in 21.25 says everyone did what what was right in his own eyes. And we know that never works out very well, does it? Uh, the book begins in chapter one by telling us that Elimelech, a Jewish man, took his wife, Naomi, and his two sons, Malan and Chilean, from Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab because there was a famine in the land. Now we know that the country of Moab was on the east side of the Dead Sea. They were uh, an idolatrous country, the Moabites were, and uh, they were descendants of Lot's son by his eldest daughter. They were mortal enemies of the Jew Jewish people, but there was a famine, and I don't know if uh, Elimelech just did not think it through very well, what he was doing, or uh, people just do desperate things in desperate times sometimes, but Anyway, he went to Moab and took his family, and after moving there, he dies and leaves Naomi, a, a poor widow. The two sons end up marrying women of Moab, and um, even though it was forbidden by Jewish law, they did that. Malin married Ruth, and Chilean married Orpah, and Naomi ended up living there for about 10 more years. And then it said both of the sons died. Naomi at that time hears that there is bread in Bethlehem. And so she decides to go home. I can't even imagine losing my husband. I, I know that's always a possibility of losing a spouse to death um, and or even losing a child but to lose everything, lose your husband and both children, that had to be so hard. And for her to be in a foreign country just had to have made it worse. She wanted to be home and surrounded by her extended family, I'm sure, wanted to be home where it was familiar to her. I can understand that. My sister-in-law just 
uh, had a funeral for her brother and her other brother had already passed away and her mother who has been a widow for a number of years is still living she's in her 90s and um, I, I thought about this so much when I was studying for this lesson that Ms. Bassett would know exactly how Naomi felt uh, the difference is Ms. Bassett uh, who now has lost both sons and a husband is surrounded by her daughter, all of her grandchildren, and uh, all of her extended family. She's she, she's at home, and so I can see where Naomi would would want to go back uh, to what was familiar to her. Orpa and Ruth travel with Naomi for uh, a distance. It doesn't really say how far, and uh, Naomi encourages them to go back and be with their family and stay in their homeland. And um, Cindy Colley did a lesson on Orpa. I think it was the very first one. And she did an excellent job of talking to us about our consequences and our choices. And Orpa turned back. We never hear from her again. I know she obviously loved Naomi very much. She wept, you know, they, they all wept at the time, but she ended up turning back and we never hear from her again. We do not know what happened to her. But Ruth is not going to be persuaded. She is going to go with Naomi. And she made a commitment to Naomi when she said these beautiful words beginning in Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. Entreat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go, and wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. These words are just as meaningful today as they were all those centuries ago. They're beautiful words. Even though they're spoken from a daughter-in-law to a mother-in-law, many people use them at weddings. I know our 50th anniversary is coming up in just a few weeks, and it was saying at my wedding. But we're going to see that these words, we can learn a lot from these words about um, commitment and love. The consequences of Ruth's choice had a very beautiful ending. And tonight I want us to look at the lessons that we can learn from this book when it comes to choosing a mate. You may be thinking, I'm not old enough to be thinking about getting married. I'm only 13 or 14 or even 16 or 17. But girls, it's never too early to start thinking about that. Um, you most likely are going to marry someone since we don't have arranged marriages in our country, you're going to marry someone who you date or court, uh, different people call it different things, and you're going to date or court someone from your circle of friends. So it's very, very important that you choose your friends wisely. And we're going to just turn, uh, uh, go through the book and consider some things that we can learn from the book of Ruth. There's seven things that I want you to write down. Put them in your hope chest. You may not you think, what is a hope chest? Uh, when I was growing up, girls had a chest, kind of like a little cedar chest, and you would collect things all along. Maybe your grandmother made you um, a table scarf or a knitted you an afghan or you got some special towels or dishes passed down and you put them in your hope chest and you save them for the day when you got married. It was just a process over the years. Um, maybe you have a keepsake box. You put special little things in there. You could put this list in there or even write them in the back of your Bible. But they need to be a constant reminder of what it takes to make a wise choice in a mate. Some of them will apply to you and some of them will apply to the person who may potentially be your mate, but all of them are very important. The first one is before considering a mate, you need to make a commitment to the Lord. 
you personally need to make a commitment to the Lord. Ruth made a commitment to Naomi when she said, wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Even though that would mean that she would have to leave her homeland and all that she had ever known. And I, I think she realized, I mean, when you look at the rest of the book, she knew exactly what she was saying and she meant it. She was making a commitment. Likewise, we need to commit to following the Lord before we ever start looking for a mate. I want you to notice that Naomi did not force Ruth to go with her from Moab back to Bethlehem. Neither does the Lord force us to leave that far country of sin and follow him. But he wants us to count the cost. We have to count the cost. If you turn to Luke 14, 25 through 33, it says, Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever of you do not, does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Some are not willing to pay the price. Turn with me to Matthew 19, chapter 19. Beginning with verse 16. Now this is a, well, what we often refer to as the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. It says, Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? So he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. But if you want to enter your life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you want to be perfect, go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. He was not willing to make that commitment to the Lord, was he? Ruth said, Your people shall be my people. Most of you watching are probably uh, from Christian families, and that is a blessing. That is really a blessing. I did not have that blessing. Now, my parents uh, were very God-fearing people, but they were members of a denomination, and they never did obey the gospel before they passed away, and that breaks my heart. And I know it's hard sometimes when you... Um, are in families where not maybe not anybody's a member of the church, but sometimes even if one parent is and the other parent isn't, and, and and that's um, it makes it very difficult in the family to to be united and feel united. I can tell you, it's hard to leave. I was about eighteen when I obeyed the gospel, and although my parents didn't disown me or anything like that. I could tell that they were very disappointed that I left what I had always been a part of in our family for generations. And uh, our relationship was just a little strained after that. We loved each other and we took care of each other and we treated each other with, with respect, but it just changed things for us. And um, there was just always a little something there that, um, 
made it difficult. It, it was something that I didn't share and it made it hard. So I can only imagine what Ruth was going through when she left not only uh, this uh, idolatrous religion that she had probably been raised in, but moved away from her family altogether. Um, some families turn their backs completely on a family member who obeys the gospel. Uh, but you know what? Jesus promised in Mark 10, 29 through 30, Assuredly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life. Now, like I said, my family didn't turn their back on me, but our relationship really wasn't the same. But girls, I can't tell you, God has so richly blessed me with mothers in the faith and brothers and sisters and fathers in the faith. I have people all over this country who I could call at a moment's notice. They have uh, taken me under their wing. I have learned from them and um, I just know they're there for me. And you think, well, even houses, I dare say if I was somewhere and my car broke down, I needed a place to stay there. I could have someone come pick me up in a minute's notice because there are Christians all over this country who will be there for us if we need them in a time like that. So God has blessed me abundantly and he will you too. We often sing the song, God's Family. And I, when I think about the chorus, it says, sometimes we laugh together and sometimes we cry. Sometimes we share together heartaches and sighs. Sometimes we dream together of how it will be when we all get to heaven, God's family. And that's really what it's all about, isn't it? It's not necessarily these earthly relationships so much as it is our spiritual relationship with one another. And God's family can be a wonderful source of strength to us as we're trying to make our way towards heaven. When, um, when Ruth said, your God shall be my God, she meant that she was turning her back on that idolatrous worship of her homeland. The idol, uh, the false God that uh, they worshiped in Moab, they even offered human sacrifices too. I think his name was Chemosh is how you pronounce it. And um, yes, Chemosh. And they would even offer human sacrifices. So we know that it's not something that the God of heaven would ever expect of his children. And she was willing to turn her back on that for the true and living God. And we must do that too if we were going to live a happily ever after story in our own lives. Number two, we need to commit to our mate. When we get married, it is a commitment. It's not all, like I said, fairy tales and living happily ever after because he's so cute and um, she's so beautiful and they live in a castle. That's not what it's all about. It's about commitment. Almost always at a wedding ceremony, you will hear these words. I, Denise, take thee, Jerry, to be lawful wedded husband or wife, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part. Now, I'm pretty positive on that day when you've got the beautiful wedding dress on and the flowers and the pretty music, most couples are concentrating more on the better and the richer and the health rather than on the worse, the poorer, and the sickness. When they make those vows, that commitment, they're not thinking a whole lot about the worse, the poorer, and the sickness. But those days may come, and that's not when you bail out and say, this is not what I signed up for. You have to be committed to stay in that relationship, um, even when the going gets tough. They're not just words at a ceremony. 
they represent commitment. I want to tell you about a, a couple that we met probably about 20 years ago, close to 20 years ago, when we moved to the Memphis area to work with the congregation. And there was a, an older couple. They seemed older at the time. Um, <laughs> I'm getting there myself. But um, Mr. Jack had been in the Navy. He was handsome and strong. They had a wall um, where there were pictures of him back in World War II. They had been uh, in love since they were in junior high. They went to school together, this couple, and Miss Olive tells the sweetest stories about them going through school and then him going in the Navy and going off to war and how hard it was. And anyway, at the, by this time, they were probably uh, in their early 70s and he was beginning to have some health problems. And um, a few years went by and his health just deteriorated more and more. And uh, he had to go in a care facility and Miss Olive would go up there every day and spend the day with him and feed lunch. And he had gotten to the point where he just could not take care of himself. He would drool when he ate. And this, this big, strong, handsome man who had taken care of her um, for over half a century was now having to be taken care of by this little woman who told me one time she only gained, oh, she only weighed more than 100 pounds twice, and that was when she was pregnant. Um, she she would go up there and she would feed him and she would wipe his face and when he would make a mess and um, he couldn't talk anymore. And it was just a pitiful, pitiful sight. And uh, one day, Jerry, my husband, was up visiting and she uh, was feeding him and the nurse came in and she said, Mom, Miss Olive, let me do that. And uh, Miss Olive said, no, uh, that's okay, I'll, I'll do it. And so then uh, after a little bit, she said, no, no, let me let me do it. And, and she she argued with her and she said, no, I'm, I'm good, I, I, I've got it. And after a little bit, she said, Miss Olive, you need to just go home and rest and let me do that. That's what I get paid for. And I wasn't there, I wish I had been, but Jerry said she turned around and she put her finger up in that a nurse's face and she said, let me tell you something. I made a vow 55 years ago and I intend to keep it. She had made a vow that she was gonna be with him in sickness and in health for better or for worse and it, it had it was the worst you know those years of being young and strong and healthy and everything going great uh, they were no longer there and uh, she but she said I've made a vow I made a commitment and I intend to keep that commitment and that's what we have to be willing to do before we get married we need to make our minds up that we're going to be committed number three you need to marry somebody or look for somebody that is going to be able to physically take care of you. In chapter 2, verse 1 through 8 of the book of Ruth, it says, There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him, in whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers, and she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was with the family of Elimelech. So we know from the uh, verse 1 there that he, Boaz, was a man of great wealth. Now, I'm not telling you that you have to marry somebody who is rich. Don't go away from this lesson telling, let me, uh, saying that I said that. But I, Jerry and I do a lot of counseling and we have couples who come to us who are struggling years after they have been married. Uh, the husband won't keep a job. He will not provide for his family. He's basically just lazy and he's not responsible. If you are dating slash courting, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, someone, and he's still living at home with his parents, he doesn't keep a job, he's not paying his own bills, you don't need to rush into a marriage. Uh, Jerry often tells couples, um, 
that if they, uh, they need to be whole themselves. They need to be a whole, unique individual, a complete individual who can stand on their own two feet before they go into a marriage with someone else. You often hear people say, oh, I couldn't make it without this person. They complete me. You don't need to have someone else that you depend on to complete you, whether it's emotionally or um, spiritually. You need to be that whole individual yourself before you enter into a, a relationship like marriage. Marriage is the second greatest decision I do believe that you will ever make other than being a Christian, becoming a Christian, that is the decision that is going to determine whether you spend eternity in heaven or not. That person can pull you down or help you by, by be by your side and y'all can go to heaven together if you work at it. But if, if you're looking at someone and you know you just feel like you can't live without them but mama's still paying the phone bill and daddy's still paying the car payment and the insurance and putting gas in the car you might ought to wait a while and uh, let him uh, stand on his own two feet first timothy 5 8 says if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his household he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever so don't rush into a relationship, especially into an, a marriage, until you see that that person is a whole, unique individual themselves, uh, spiritually and physically. Number four, make sure that whoever is uh, you are considering marrying is more attracted to your inward beauty than your outward beauty. In chapter 2, verse 10, and I, we don't have time to read this whole book, please sometime this week read through and, and fill in the gaps. Uh, but we're just having to hit the high spots. And uh, please read through the whole book. It is a, it's just a beautiful book. But beginning in verse 10, it says, so, uh, Ruth fell on her face and bowed down to the ground and said to, to him, Boaz, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Uh, Ruth had been gleaning in the fields and Boaz had told his workers he had asked about her. He had told them to leave extra grain and so she could pick it up and to allow her to, to keep working with his uh, the, the other girls that were there gleaning in the field, picking up the, it was the barley harvest and then the wheat harvest. So um, he had allowed her to do that so that she could take care of Naomi. And it's when she asked, why, why are you doing this? He said, he said, Boaz answered and said to her, it has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. Nowhere does it say, oh, I thought you were just beautiful or you have a really cute figure. It wasn't about outward appearance at all. Boaz saw what kind of person that uh, Ruth was, that she had given up everything to come with Naomi and take care of her. Um, he noticed that she was not afraid of hard work too. And Proverbs 31, 30 says, Charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. And then in 1 Peter 3, 3 through 4, it says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fair, fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of the Lord. And then last, 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. The man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
what kind of person you are. Not, not that thing that beats in your chest and pumps blood all over your body, but the kind of person you are, your mind, your will. Um, that's what God looks, like, looks at. Likewise, it doesn't say that Ruth was attracted to Boaz because he was this hunk of a guy and he was good looking and had muscles. It, it doesn't say anything about that. But Ruth saw what kind of man he was. He was compassionate. He was kind. He was caring, which means he wasn't selfish and self-centered, narcissistic, thinking only of himself. Boaz wanted to make sure that Ruth, and therefore Naomi, was taken care of. He told her, don't go to any other fields. He told the workers to leave the extra grain. He didn't do it to be seen of others. He didn't make a big proclamation at the city gate. He did it behind the scenes. And he also didn't want to humiliate her. I, I thought about that as I was reading through. But he did let her do what she could do for herself. Um, chapter 2, verse 17. Ruth told Boaz that he had been a comfort to her. In verse 13, would you rather be married to someone who's good looking and knows it or to someone who's going to be a comfort to you? Looks are going to fade, girls, I can tell you. You get married and after a few years, um, you have a few babies and a few uh, extra pounds or maybe some stretch marks and that guy that had that thick full head of hair maybe bald by the time he's 30 and so it it's not about the outward appearance you need to yourself and whoever you are looking at to marry needs to be someone on the inside that's beautiful Number five, listen to godly advice. When we turn to chapter three, uh, reading the first six verses, Naomi is telling um, uh, Ruth, who uh, may not be accustomed to all the, the customs and the laws of the Jewish people. And so she is explaining to her what to do so that the near kinsman can redeem her. If you get a chance this week, look at Deuteronomy 19, 11, and then chapter 25, verses 5 through 10. And this talks about the process of when a widow dies, the brother would redeem her and have children by her in his brother's name to keep the family name going. And um, so... Ruth, uh, Naomi was giving Ruth some advice here on how, uh, of course, there was no brother left because both brothers had died. And so it went to the near kinsman, the closest relative. And Naomi told Ruth, uh, we don't have time to read all the verses, but if you read down through about the first six verses, she told her about going to the threshing floor. She told her when to go. She told her how to dress. She told her to be patient and when to make herself known to him. Basically, this process was Ruth proposing to Boaz and letting him know that she was available to be married. And um, we need to, before we make this huge decision, Get the advice of older women, people who have been married a long time. Uh, there's kind of a, a custom of uh, at showers sometimes of uh, giving advice. Maybe it's a jar or a basket and everybody's supposed to write down a piece of advice. Well, I think that's a little late. It's usually just a few weeks before the ceremony. The flowers are ordered, the dress has been bought, uh, all the attendants are lined up and the venue and everything's ready to go and then you get advice and that should have been way sooner. So <laughs> we need to uh, think about that and, and get any advice that we need from an older godly woman to uh, help us to make that wise decision. Titus 2, 3 through 4 talks about the older woman teaching the younger woman how to love her husband and love her children. And now why don't we just turn over there? I know you probably all are very, very familiar with that passage, but it is extremely important and um, that, that we do that. 
so. All right, chapter 2 of Titus, verse 3. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of the good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. So older women can teach you a lot of things, and we don't need to wait until right before we're going to walk down the aisle. We need to get good godly advice from older women. Look around at those couples who have been married 40, 50, 60 years even, and let them give you advice on, on how to make your own happily ever after. Verse 6 of Ruth um, says, Ruth did all that her mother-in-law instructed her. It doesn't do any good for someone to give you advice if you're not going to take the advice. But Ruth, in this case, it said she did all that her mother-in-law instructed her to do. Number 6, you want to marry someone who is concerned about your reputation? Who cares about your reputation? Look at um, verse 7 of chapter 3. It says, And after Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was cheerful, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. And she, Ruth, came softly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. Now it happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and there a woman was lying at his feet. And he said, Who are you? So she answered, I am Ruth, your maidservant. Take your maidservant under your wing, for you are a close relative. So she's she's telling him, basically proposing to him, and uh, reminding him of his responsibility. Then he said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, in that you did not go after young men, whether rich or poor. So he noticed he noticed her and the kind of life that she was living. Now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you request. For all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. She had a good reputation, didn't she? Not just with Boaz, but in the entire community. And he didn't want to do anything that was going to ruin that. Verse 12 says, Now it is true that I am a close relative. However, there is a relative closer than I. Stay this night, and in the morning it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. So lie down until morning. She lay down at his feet until morning, and she arose before one could recognize another. He said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. He wanted her to go ahead and leave, and um, didn't want anybody to question what she was doing there or um, do anything that might hurt her reputation. Um, if you're dating someone and they want you to do something that might hurt your reputation, whether it's being dressing immodestly, it, it won't hurt. We're, we're off. Nobody's going to see you that knows us. You can wear that skimpy outfit. If he wants you to go to places that are inappropriate or do things that are something that a Christian wouldn't do, then you do not need to be in a relationship with that person. Whether it's just a friend or someone who's a little more serious than that, you need to make sure that you marry somebody um, and so therefore court or date someone. Even just be friends with someone who is not going to influence you to do anything that is going to hurt your reputation. Um, and then number seven, the last thing, you want to marry someone who's willing to put his own desires aside to do what is best for you. Once Ruth made her proposal, you might say, Boaz could have said, oh, yes, great. Uh, let, let me get that taken care of and we'll get married. But Boaz was an honorable man. He didn't do that. He knew he was not the nearest kinsman 
but he promised her that the next day he would take care of that. And he said if, um, if the other man is not willing to do that, then I will. Uh, in Numbers 27, 8 through 11, it tells about whoever buys the property must also uh, take the wife. So he knew that when he bought the property that Naomi was selling, that he would have to marry Ruth. Um, he wanted to settle it. He wanted to get it settled the next day. He didn't want it to linger on. And um, some of the things that they did back then are, are funny to us now, but a lot of business was handled at the city gate. It talked about the witnesses. And that's kind of similar to us going to our city hall, I think. Um, it's a place where business trans transactions take place. When the near kinsman refused to buy the land, then Boaz was free to do that. And he had the means to do that. Um, and he and to marry Muth, Ruth. Um, I, I laugh every time I read this passage because the the man took off his sandal and gave it to Boaz. I, I, one of a uh, commentary that I read said it, it was kind of like us getting a paper notarized, and I <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. Um, those are the seven things that I that I hope you will write down and and really think about. When we look at the last chapter, chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 13 and going through 17, we can definitely see that this was a happily ever after story. Let's read that. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and when he went in to her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons has born, born him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there is a son born to Naomi. And they called his name Obed, he is the father of Jesse, the father of David. The account of Ruth and Boaz is definitely a happily ever after story, isn't it? Um, does this mean they never faced any challenges or heartache through life? I, I seriously doubt it. But we do know there were many, many blessings. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from above. Um, Naomi was blessed with this wonderful, beautiful child that she could uh, take care of and nurse. And Ruth, who was a Gentile from a foreign country, got to be in the lineage of Christ. What an honor. When Ruth made the choice to leave all to follow Naomi, she probably never would have believed how blessed she would be and how happily her story would end. So we need to make our choices carefully, especially when it comes to the choice of who you were going to spend the rest of your life with. Like I said earlier, I, I do believe that's the second most important decision you will ever make. I want to end with another story. A few years ago, probably oh, 15 years ago now, maybe 20, a young teenage girl came to get some advice from my husband. She had been struggling with some things, and he I, he doesn't share personal things that, that uh, people tell him in counseling sessions. But uh, both of them have shared this part of the story, and uh, so I, I have heard it, and I thought it would be appropriate today. But after a period of time went by, she uh, uh, mentioned to him that she worshipped with a little small congregation, mostly elderly people. There were no teenagers, nobody that she could um, date or really spend any time with that was her age. And she said, I, I don't know if I'll ever find a, a husband. And he told her, he said, you go home and read the book of Ruth. And then I want to encourage you to just get busy gleaning in the fields, working in the kingdom, and you will run into your Boaz. So uh, 
a, a period of time went by, I think two or three years went by, and one day he got a phone call from this young lady, and she said, Mr. Jerry, Mr. Jerry, I have found my Boaz. And uh, she was so excited. She had continued to work with that little congregation, worship with them on Sundays, um, but she graduated from high school and got ready to go to college, and she was still driving back and forth on weekends. It was close enough that she could go home and worship with her uh, little group of elderly people on Sundays. But on Wednesday night sometimes, she would uh, stay in where she was going to college, and um, they would uh, have a, like a youth a college class, I guess, and she met a young man there, and they ended up falling in love. We got to go to their wedding. It was it was just a wonderful, wonderful time. Um, they went to Memphis School of Preaching, and after the two years that they were there in school, his first job out of school was with that little congregation. So she stayed with them. She worked in the kingdom. She gleaned in the fields of, of, of the Lord's work. And she ran into her Boaz like that. And they ended up going back and spending several years with that congregation uh, and being a blessing to them and uh, to, the, to the congregation. And then the Elderly people were a blessing to them and as young couple, and it, it just turned out wonderful. And uh, so I think about that so many times when I read the book of Ruth. It, it's kind of a modern day uh, Ruth and Boaz story. Even if you never marry in this life, if you never find anybody that you feel like uh, will help you get to heaven and you stay all uh, alone, uh, so to speak, unmarried. If you're first committed to the Lord and you go to heaven and spend eternity with Him, that's the best happily ever after story that you could hope for. I just pray that you will always put God first, whether it's in your own personal life, in your marriage, when you're raising your children, in your jobs, uh, Whatever you choose to do, always put God first. And that will be your happily ever after story, that you will be in heaven with, with God. Play with, pray with me as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, time that we could study with the uh, young women who have chosen to look at a passage from your word and learn from it, learn the lessons that they can apply to their lives. Thank you for everyone who is participating in these studies. Thank you for their mothers. Thank you for their grandmothers who are trying to teach them the way of the Lord. I just pray that they will always have receptive hearts and that they will always put you first in everything that they do. Help us to always um, look to you for guidance and look to your word so that we know how to live our lives in the best way possible. Thank you most of all for Jesus who died that we may have eternity with you in heaven. In Jesus name, amen. For tuning in to the PTP Teen Girls Facebook group brought to you by the 70 West Church of Christ in Hot Springs, Arkansas. Please join us next week when B.J. Rollo will bring us a lesson on JL. So tell your friends, and we will see you next Saturday night at 8.30.